Welcome, everybody. We are so glad you're here. We've been planning. We've been so excited. It's been fun to see how many people are really interested in this burning topic, and we're going to get right into it. Um, Thank you, Janine. Zach. Yep. Thanks, everybody. We are, as Laura said, thrilled that you're here. This has been an incredible response to this workshop and this topic. And we are planning to make the very most of the time we have. So with that in mind, I'm delighted to jump right in and introduce Laura Davis. Laura is the author of seven books. The first, The Courage to Heal, published in 1988, cracked open the topic of how to, see, how to heal from sexual abuse for millions of survivors, including me. Laura has written on sexual abuse, parenting, the path from estrangement to reconciliation, and her new book, The Burning Light of Two Stars, is a memoir about her tumultuous, lifelong relationship with her mother. The book seeks to answer the question, can you caretake a parent who betrayed you in the past? It also is a semifinalist for the Book Life Prize. Congratulations, Laura. Laura has been teaching writing for the last 20 years online and in workshops and retreats in the US and internationally. She's taking a group of lucky writers to Tuscany this June. Laura has been tackling the issues and challenges of writing about family throughout her career. Um, and just to turn the tables on you a bit, it's my great pleasure to introduce Janine Ouellette, um, whose deeply personal recent memoir, The Part That Burns, which was an amazing read, um, was a Kirkus Best 100 indie book, Next Generation Book Award finalist, and Rumpus Book to Read in 2021. Um, her work has appeared widely in literary journals as well as anthologies, including Passed On, Daughters Write About Father Lack, Loss, and Legacy, Ms. Aligned, Women Writing About Men, great title, and Women's Lives, Multicultural Perspectives. In addition to her literary writing, Janine spent a decade in the 90s and early 2000s editing a parenting magazine as well as an editorial column, and in these roles wrote extensively about family. She teaches writing workshops, classes, and retreats in a variety of in-person and online venues, including the University of Minnesota, Catapult, the Minnesota Prison Writing Project, and Elephant Rock, a creative writing program she founded in Minneapolis. Thank you, Laura. It's really delightful to be here with you. So the huge response to this invitation has reinforced just how pivotal, pivotal and pressing and fraught this subject is for memoir writers. We're going to spend the first hour of our time today, Laura and I, sharing our personal experiences and our mistakes relevant to this topic. We'll do that by interviewing each other with a series of four questions each. And we've prepped and timed this portion pretty carefully so that we can cram in as much as we possibly can. Then after the hour, we'll take questions from you. First, a few caveats. The first and most important thing we want to clarify is that ethics are different than legalities and we're not literary attorneys. We're approaching this as an ethical question that every writer has to wrestle with. It depends on the relationship you already have and how important it is to you to protect it. It depends on what you're writing about. Legal action isn't the only way family members can strike back. You can be harassed in multiple ways. In addition to being cut off, condemned, attacked, or estranged, family members can undermine your credibility in online spaces and in your communities, as has happened to some of our peers in recent times. But good things can also happen, things we don't expect. Outcomes are not always negative, and sometimes we expect an earthquake, but get a shiver or silence. We just never know. Um, invariably, whenever this topic comes up um, online or in a class or workshop, people quote Anne Lamott, who said, if people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. <laughs> and we actually think the topic is a lot more complex than that. Um, we will not be offering a single set of rules because there is no absolute right or wrong answer. Everything about this topic is situational. You'll have to make your own determinations. And you'll see that when Laura and I start asking each other questions. 
But when we planned this workshop, we were able to identify one thing that really is universally applicable. And that is that when you publish, it's permanent. So it's worth thinking about the implications of what you put into print over time. While it is your story, which is another sort of, um, you know, uh, saying we hear again and again, it's your story, you have a right to tell it. And that's true. But whether you tell it and how you tell it can affect your relationships over the long run. And whether there are steps you can take to minimize the potential damage in your relationships might be worth thinking about. Some of the steps might be easy and they might not compromise the work at all. Other steps might be harder to take and they might alter or diminish the story in certain ways, but it might be worth it to you or it might not. It's going to be up to every writer in the long run to run that cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. This is something both Laura and I have done, and we've come out on different ends of that equation in different situations. And you'll learn about that in our interviews. And we're going to jump into that right now with my first question for Laura, which is, Laura, I would love for you to tell us about how your relationship to this important issue has changed over the course of your long writing career. All right, so I have been publishing for 40 plus years, and during that time, I have done a ton of writing about my family. Um, and for most of that time, I basically, to be honest, I really thought about this, I steamrolled over the objections of my family members, basically just giving lip service to them, pretty much doing what I wanted and then finding ways to justify it. Um, early on, I prioritized my writing, my need to tell the truth my need to help people, and my desire to be published over the objections of family members. And here, I want to make it clear, I'm referencing family members who didn't directly abuse me. They just wanted their privacy. So here's some of my evolution on this topic. Uh, my first book, The Courage to Heal, came out in 1988. I was 31 years old. Um, it's a guide to help women, all survivors of sexual abuse, heal. Um, it was a book that was primarily information, a how-to book with, you know, the interviews I did with over a couple hundred survivors. Yet there were parts of my life I did reveal in that book. I wasn't a big part of it. I was just a tiny thread, but I did out my grandfather, uh, my maternal grandfather, who was my perpetrator. And I, the whole time, the three and a half years we were writing that book, I was absolutely terrified about how my extended family would react. Um, I had to go to therapy over this issue because I was just in so much anxiety and terror. Um, and ultimately, I took the advice that Ellen Bass had given in The Courage to Heal to any survivors of sexual abuse who were considering disclosing abuse to family members. And that was, what is the worst thing that could happen? And could you live with it? And so that was the question that I went to therapy with and that I worked with for several years before deciding to go ahead with the publication. Um, in that instance, I did not, I mean, my family knew I was writing a book about incest. That was all they knew. I never showed them any of it. I never considered showing any of them any of it. Um, and when the book came out, my very worst fears were realized. I became deeply estranged from my mother and her whole side of the family. Um, from their point, I, their point of view, I was not only spreading lies, I was now doing it on national TV. Uh, it was an incredibly painful and difficult time for me. Um, I, I basically, you know, the book became mega successful. It sold almost 2 million copies. And uh, I became um, famous for the worst thing that had happened to me. And I gained the world and lost my family. It was uh, quite challenging. Um, over the next couple of decades, I walked uh, a rather complicated path in which I made peace with my mother and her side of the family, um, a story in part that I tell in the burning light of two stars. Um, and 20 years after The Courage to Heal, I published a book called I Thought We'd Never Speak Again. And this was a how-to book about the process of reconciliation. Um, again, it primarily was um, a how-to book. It included many, many stories of other people. And there was a very small thread about my estrangement and reconciliation with my mother. Um, this time, 
I wanted my mother to read the manuscript before it went to press uh, because I didn't want the book I had written that was inspired by our reconciliation to put us back into a deep estrangement. Um, in theory, she had said yes when I said I wanted to write this book and that she would be a part of it, but I didn't let her read any of it until very close to the end. Um, I had learned early on in my career not to show things to people prematurely. Um, I gave her a month to read it. Um, I asked her to write comments on it. And the one main question I had was, tell me if there's anything in here that you can't live with. That's how I put it to her. Um, you know, I tell the whole story of this in the memoir, so I'm not going to tell it here. Um, but in the end, there were two things she asked me to change. Um, both of them were easily changed, and neither one hurt the book in any way. So I was happy to do that for her. Um, and despite the incredible dread I felt leading up to this publication, um, she actually became a champion of the book. She wrote a letter um, that ended up in the press kit supporting the book and talking about how hard it was for her to let me publish it, but that she felt committed to helping other people with estranged relationships. I, I just never thought that would happen. Um, after that book came out, I went through a very long period of not publishing, actually 19 years. Um, some of it was because my focus was helping other writers tell their stories. But underneath that, to be honest, I actually felt constrained. Um, there were people I didn't want to write about. Um, there were situations I felt I couldn't write about. And underneath all of it, I think, was just this dread of not wanting to go through that kind of loss again. Um, but then I felt compelled to write this memoir, my latest book. Um, I just felt I had to write it. I'd been circling around this topic for 30, 40 years. I felt like I finally had the perspective to tell the whole story, not just a tiny thread of it. Um, and for the first nine years I worked on this memoir, I just had to tell myself, I'm doing this for me. I'll decide about publishing it later. Um, I did tell my immediate family, my spouse of over 30 years, um, our three kids and my brother, because all of them were actual characters in the book. And I really wanted their support going into this. Um, but I didn't share any of the actual writing for many years. Um, and then there was my extended family. And they were the ones that I was the most concerned about. They were the ones who had rejected me in the past. Um, and the way I dealt with it was extremely different than The Courage to Heal, which had been 32 years earlier. Because I think in part because I had already deeply resolved these issues in my own life, it felt like the, the sexual abuse and everything I had written about my mother felt like it was more in the distant past and integrated. And I felt because of that, I could afford to feel some compassion for the people in my family who would be really upset with this publication. And it didn't have anything to do with whether they were right or wrong. You know, I felt they were wrong. You know, their perception of the past was based on denial. But to me, that didn't matter. What mattered was that my decision to publish this book would cause them distress um, that they wouldn't have experienced if I hadn't written it. Um, and I was doing what I wanted. I was publishing the book. I was telling it the way I wanted to. Um, but when I looked at these, this is mostly cousins of mine who had shared the same grandfather, um, my attitude toward them was compassion. And so I very carefully crafted a letter to them, um, not asking their permission, but informing them. Um, and I'm gonna make that letter available to all of you um, after today's workshop so you could see what I said. Um, so I wanna, I wanna turn this back to Janine um, and ask you basically the same question and to see if your views and your practices regarding writing about family have changed over time. Well, first of all, Laura, I just I just want to um, thank you um, for that perspective and and also for the courage to heal. I see that coming up again and again in the chat and just hearing the backstory behind your lived experience and the price you paid for that book deepens that gratitude. So I want to thank you for that. I also um, I love this question about how a writer's views about this issue change over time, and I love pairing with you on this because my story, 
my answer to that question is almost an inverse of yours. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've also been writing for a very long time. I published my first story almost exactly 30 years ago. I was 24 and it came out in the Chisago County Press, a little county newspaper. And then by 27, I became editor of a parenting magazine, as Laura mentioned. I published a children's picture book about my daughter, who was a toddler at the time. And then by my early 30s, I became a features writer for an arts and culture magazine. And I also, for that magazine, wrote a, an editorial column called Wife Interrupted. I was going through a divorce at the time. <laughs> um, great, great title. Yeah, um, it was a really fun column to write. And all through that time, I was extremely careful about what I revealed. And I walked this really fine line between wanting to write work that had, you know, a crackle. I wanted it to be alive and I wanted it to mean something. But I most of all never went, Laura, when we've talked before, you've mentioned going where the heat is. And for me, the heat was all in my childhood. I never wrote about my abusive childhood never in print mentioned the sexual abuse by my stepfather or the emotional and physical abuse by my mother. It wasn't until I was in my 40s when I first started publishing literary work that I took on those topics. And the way I was finally able to overcome the barriers that kept me from that most burning material, other than therapy and time, were specific literary devices that I've written about and lectured on quite a bit. And we'll link to a craft essay that I wrote on that topic in the chat. But for now, I wanna talk about what kept me from those stories all those years. In addition to the usual fears we all have about reactions from family and maybe the public, I had fear of negative artistic judgment by respected editors, critics, et cetera. And unfortunately, I had an early experience confirming those fears. I had a chance to write an essay for a literary academic journal called On the Issues, a feminist journal. And I wrote what I now know we'd call a braided essay that combined my early childhood sexual abuse story with a kind of a present day analysis of being invisibilized as a stay at home mom with little kids. And when I turned the essay in, the editor had lots of high praise for my writing. It was really encouraging, but she also suggested as her major editorial note that we keep the motherhood strand and cut the childhood story out entirely. And I was just flooded with shame. It, it, was, it was devastating. And I didn't try to write or publish that material again for 20 more years. And when I did finally start writing and publishing literary work and going where this heat was. And that was about 10 years ago. Both my mom and my older sister asked explicitly to be left out of what they called my nonfiction writing. And in the case of my sister, I honor that request. And I do that for ethical and relationship reasons. And I'm gonna talk about more um, on that later in this workshop. In the case of my mother, I don't honor the request. And that also is exactly about ethical and relationship reasons and the ethics being that my mother was an adult and she had full agency over the choices she made. And not only that, but also she has estranged herself from me on and off since I was literally still a child. So I don't feel the same protectiveness of that relationship, which is, you know, continues to be highly conflicted. Um, in the same way that I feel protective of my relationship with my older sister. I also, with my mother, have never offered her um, the chance to read my work pre-publication. She's too volatile, and I don't feel safe to do that. But I did, when the publication of The Part That Burns was imminent, send her an email about the book. Um, and I did that because she began to, to my great confusion, she began posting about my book very enthusiastically on Facebook. <laughs> and I, I, um, I, I was distressed. Uh -huh. I, I, I thought, I thought, I thought, you know, I thought I've been, I, I had published stories and essays from the book um, in the years leading up to it that she was very angry about and it, it none of it made sense. So I thought I, I need to make sure my mom knows what this book is about. So I will also share that email after this event. It's not as um, beautiful or long as Laura's letter to her family though. So I'm also gonna just quickly read it to you right now. I emailed my mom and I said, dear mom, I'm writing to you about my book. 
There's nothing in it with regard to my childhood that hasn't already been published. It's just the way it's assembled to make a fragmented collage that creates its book form. I know the topics, childhood sexual abuse and the great difficulties leading up to foster care for Rachel and me are not easy and there's no reason for you to read it again if you don't wish to. These events were a very long time ago. But for me, learning how to write about these traumas was a crucial part of healing from them. We know childhood sexual abuse is deeply damaging in a way that's lifelong. The neural pathways it affects are still in development during childhood. But ultimately, my book, like many memoirs, is about healing and moving on. It's about forgiveness and transformation. And that's where my focus is now as well. Maybe you can view this book as an artifact of the past, about past versions of ourselves, and be at peace with it. That's something I've seen happen with other writers who've been through very hard things in childhood. It's also okay if you ignore the book. I totally understand and support that. I just hope we don't have new conflict over things that are over. There's no reason for that to happen. The world is hard enough, so hard between COVID and our incredibly unstable politics, and none of us know what's in store. Life has never felt more fragile. It would mean a lot if we could just have peace. And then lastly to this question, I wanna give two quick examples about how my previous comfort level with writing about seemingly ordinary events um, about everyday life with the people who are close to me changed over time. The first one, as I mentioned, um, I was a parenting editor for several years and I wrote a parenting column that was enjoyable, it was popular, I still get letters about it sometimes 25 years later. My kids were little, they were all under 10, and it felt really easy to write about motherhood in a way that was meaningful and revelatory without risking much. But I was wrong, because what happened is I wrote a lovely column for Father's Day one year about my then husband, how healing it was to watch him with our children, having not really had a father myself. And when we separated a few years later, he used that column against me in our custody case. And I know similar things have happened to other writers, including um, the well-known writer, Joyce Maynard. Another example, a few years later, I was writing my column for the Arts and Culture Mag, and I tried to write a lighthearted essay about my oldest daughter who was on the verge of adolescence. I got her permission, I thought everything was okay. But a couple of parents in her class at school read the essay, mm -hmm. the kids in her class found out about it. She was angry. My ex-husband who was hostile fanned those flames. And um, he even wrote a nasty letter to the publisher describing that our daughter lived in uh, the light with him as Persephone and in Haiti <laughs> with me, um, which you know was obviously embarrassing. So. Um, I have learned that even the simplest things can can come back in unexpected ways, and I take more care now than I did in the past with those, yeah, ordinary topics. And Laura, I feel like talking about kids is a <laughs> is something that um, you have some valuable insight. You've written a ton about your kids and faced some pushback, led you to make different decisions going forward. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I want to share a couple of stories. Um, my, I have three children. Um, the oldest is 44, uh, the middle is 29, and the, the youngest is 25. Um, when my oldest son was 19 years old, um, he was going to college on the East Coast, and he decided to join the Marine Reserves. And, you know, he had grown up with lesbian mothers from Santa Cruz who were liberal and anti-war, and we freaked out you know, that he was going to join the military, especially the Marines, but any military, we tried to talk him out of it. And of course, those of you who are parents know you don't talk your young adult kids out of anything. He joined, he became a machine gunner. Um, and he served six years in the reserves. And then he finished his service. And we were like, that, you know, it was okay. Um, and a year later, the Gulf War broke out, and he got called up and sent to Iraq. So he was in Iraq as a machine gunner. Um, in the meantime, he had married his college sweetheart and they had a newborn baby. 
And um, my daughter-in-law at the time and the grandson moved in with us um, and while he was over there fighting. Um, and in our local newspaper, the Santa Cruz Sentinel, they kept running these stories where these parents were like, we're so proud of our kids over there. We support this war. And it just burned me so much. Um, I just sat down one day and I just dashed off a letter to the editor that basically talked about the fact that we support our son and we are absolutely against this war. And, you know, that not everyone who has kids over there supports the war. And, you know, I'm a writer, so they published it because it was well-written and punchy. And um, and so it, it, it was published. I didn't ask anyone. I just did it, you know. Um, and the next day I got a call from the editor of the newspaper saying, we want to come to a feature story about your family. Um, Tatiana, my daughter-in-law was all for it. I was all for it. And Karen, my spouse was dead set against it. And she really likes her privacy. And she knew that Brian wanted to be private too. She was like, no way. And again, this was a situation where I just wanted to steamroll over her objection. So we invited them, they came, Karen was reluctant. They took a ton of pictures of the baby and of all of us living in this multi-generational household. Um, and two days later, it was the front of the newspaper, this huge spread. I never told Brian about it. I thought, oh, he'll never find out. He's over there in Iraq, he'll never know. Um, and this is a mistake I made multiple times. I, like it took me a long time to learn this lesson. Someone told him about it, he was, furious. He felt betrayed. Um, he felt violated. He felt like I had invaded his privacy. He was furious at me and he blamed me and he was right. I was the ringleader really. Um, and the thing I want to say about this is, you know, this was many, many years ago and he and I have a good relationship now, but I don't believe it is as, is as intimate or close as it would have been if I hadn't done this. Like he does not trust me with his information. Um, or with his tender feelings. And I think it goes back to this experience. So I really regret having done that. Um, the second experience I had uh, was with the two younger children. Um, when Eli was two years old, I started writing a parenting column called Becoming the Parent I Want to Be. And it was focused on kind of my foibles and failings and learnings and struggles as a parent. Um, I really enjoyed writing it. And Karen, again, uh, the, the other mother of these kids, really didn't want me to write the column. And I just said to her, you know, hey, I was an author when you met me. You knew I was a writer. You knew I write about, you know, family and things that are personal to me. And I'm going to do this column. Um, again, I just kind of ran over her feelings. And the compromise we made was that I barely included her. So, you know, the, it was really about me as a parent, as opposed to us as parents. And occasionally she'd have like a little cameo where she was in the background, but she really was hardly there. Um, I had assumed that there would be some point that the kids would make it clear to me that I had to stop writing about them. But Eli was only two when I started. Uh, Lizzie wasn't even born. Um, and when Eli was five years old, he was an incredibly articulate child. He said to me one day, he said, I don't want you to write about me anymore. And, um, and I went to my parenting group that I was in and brought it up. And the facilitator, Janice Kaiser, um, said, why don't you find out what it is he's objecting to? So I went back, I was tucking him in for bed. I brought up the subject and I said, you know, why don't you want me to write the column? And he said, because when I'm at the playground, all these adults I don't know come up to me and start talking to me like they know me and I don't like it. So, um, I thought, well, I guess maybe I have to give it up. I went back and talked to Janice again. And what she suggested uh, is what I did. I started putting a little um, tagline on the bio that said, you know, if you run into me and my kids in town, please don't talk to them as if you know them. I don't remember what exactly I said, but the gist of that. And I gave him the choice to create a pseudonym for himself. He called himself Justin and his little sister became Emily. Um, but it was still... The column was by Laura Davis. Everybody knew it was them, but nobody bothered them anymore. And he seemed okay with that. 
Um, as I got older and more literate, uh, they would help me with the column. I would read it to them and we would bat ideas back and forth. I taught them to edit. I taught them about literary license. It was you know, a really great way for them to learn about being writers. And I kept it going for 10 years. Um, at that point, I felt like the issues I wanted to write about felt like they were too private and I couldn't. You know, I was not going to write about the first time I saw him having pubic hair or something like that. And you know, I just was not going to do anything like that. So it felt like I ran out of topics in terms of where the heat was for me. So I quit the column. I retired it. Um, Ten years went by. Um, they were young adults now. And I decided for a holiday gift to take the hundred columns I had written and to compile them um, and to put them in a book and a, you know, a handmade book that had really beautiful cover and art. I did a really nice professional job. I wanted to give it to them as a holiday present. You know, like here's a record of your childhood. And it seemed like the most innocent, sweet gift. It was gonna be like months for me to put this thing together. And when Karen caught wind of what I was doing, she was very upset. And the reason was that when you look at these hundred columns, she barely appears in them. And of course she had wanted that to begin with, but now here was a record of their childhood in which she barely existed. And, you know, I don't know how many of you know some of the dynamics in a lesbian family, but often I was their birth mother, the two younger kids. Um, often the birth mother is acknowledged um, and the non-biological mother becomes invisible to the outside world. So she had already lived with 20 years of that pain and here I was replicating it by creating this book in which she was invisible. Um, and so the, the, what I ended up doing is writing an introduction to the book where I talked about this issue, talked about the fact that many other people that they loved and cared about uh, were not in the book, people who were super important to them. And the third thing I focused on was that I didn't want my stories, which had been curated, edited, and shaped to supplant their own natural memories, which I think is a huge issue when you start publishing about family, the written ver version can supplant what people remember. Um, and so that's, that's what we did. Um, but it, it just, these experiences made me realize how incredibly difficult it is to write about your kids. Um, and now if I ever wanna write about them, even a Facebook post, I get their permission first. Um, so Janine, I think you said that you had a similar kind of experience. You, you mentioned your sister, and I think you're going to tell us more about that, um, where you thought something you were doing would be appreciated by her, but it was anything but. Um, can you talk about that and any other um, surprises um, or fears? Um, it, it's wild about the the similarity um, with the with the sister story, and I am going to tell that it's a significant story. Um, in terms of thinking you were going to make someone happy and having the opposite effect. But I'm going to give a few happy surprises first. So we'll kind of lighten the mood here because as we said at the beginning, things don't always go wrong. Um, yeah, so my younger sister, who is a half sister, which is only important because it means that the stepfather I'm writing about who was an abuser is her father. And despite that, She's been the biggest cheerleader of my book, second only to my kids and my husband. She loves my book, despite that I portray her father unapologetically as the serial pedophile and wife beater that he was. She loves the book, even though she still has a relationship with her dad, not much. He's not capable of much. But um, her only complaint actually about the book was that she wanted a bigger role in it. She was disappointed every time I cut the scene um, that she used to be in. So I had to promise to write more about her in a future book. Another happy surprise was my mom's side of the family. I feared their reactions because, you know, we're not close, but we're connected on social media. And when you have a book coming out that's deeply personal, anticipating any conflict is exhausting. You're just putting your heart on your sleeve. Um, but it turned out that my mom's siblings and their kids, uh, who are my cousins, and again, we're not close, but we're connected online, reached out in the most loving ways. It was totally healing to have my experiences validated like that. They sent cards and letters, they posted on social media, they bought the book, they were amazing. 
This is a just a kind of a minor note of a happy surprise um, came in the form of our neighbors, our next door neighbors. We live in a university neighborhood and they're connected to the U as, as am I. But we should have a lot in common, but we got off to a bad start when we moved into our house about six years ago because we put up a privacy fence. So it's a one of those stories not worth telling, but they weren't really friendly with us after that until my book came out and my neighbor wrote me an amazing letter about how she would, you know, hear us laughing on our porch with our kids or see me out playing with our grandchildren. And after reading my book, just felt, um, you know, that it that it said something extraordinary about who I had become um, compared to what she read about in those pages. So, you know, hey, your memoir can even repair your relationships with your neighbors. But back to fears, a couple of fears. On the eve of my book's release, and I mean like the very last minute, it was it was already edited, formatted, signed off on, on its way into readers' hands. I got terrified that my ex-boyfriend, I call him Cyrus in the book, would find me and maybe threaten me or my family. Um, he, within the last 10 years or so, he's got a criminal record and had been in federal prison for stuff that I don't even know all of what um, was involved. But I just got this wave of fear and I felt like it was probably irrational, but I couldn't know that. And we have some mutual connections, you know, that go back to high school on social media. I thought, oh, he could find out about the book, um, but nothing happened. So um, another fear I had, was that my ex-husband, who I was absolutely sure would find out about the book, might be unhappy with how he was portrayed and choose to sue me. And again, you know, Laura talked about, you know, just doing the writing and getting through the writing part and then worrying about these concerns. And I feel like that's what I did, but I, I waited really, a really long time to get to the worry part too long. So I got consumed by these fears and eventually I, mentioned to my kids that I was, you know, feeling a little concerned, but that I did have writer's insurance. And my daughter said, oh, that's good because I've been worrying about that too, <laughs> but nothing happened. But I had no idea there was such a thing as writer's insurance until this minute. We'll have to oh, oh, talk is. about that later. Yeah, I guess we should mention it. We can talk about it when we get to the questions, but mm -hmm. um, I have it through my small business. You can get it through the Authors Guild. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> The biggest um, surprise that happened for me, and, and, and during the course of the conflict I'm about to talk about, legalities were mentioned, nothing came to pass, um, but it was with my older sister. And this started long before my book deal, and what hit, hit me, I was blindsided. It was a big surprise. Um, the backstory, the context is that my sister and I grew up in a combination of close allies and arch enemies, probably like a lot of siblings. Um, we're less than two years apart. We experienced our stepfather's abuse together, often at the same time. We survived him together and we processed the trauma together over the years of our young adulthood. I didn't think I was breaking any trust with my sister when I started writing about these experiences. They weren't secret as far as I understood. Our whole family knew. So what happened is that a story that I wrote called Tumbleweeds, which became the second chapter of my book, was first selected a couple of years earlier by a literary journal um, as a second place winner in a contest judged by Joyce Carol Oates. So, you know, I was over the moon. Um, I was planning to give a copy of this journal to my sister as a Christmas present. I was so excited. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, or fortunately, before the journal arrived and I could offer this not gift, my sister learned I was going to be working with Dorothy Allison at Tin House in a writing workshop because I posted on Facebook about it. And I talked about how Dorothy was a hero of mine, how we'd experienced similar abuse. And my sister saw this and she was furious. We had an escalated back and forth on Facebook Messenger. She said a lot of things, including that I should never include her in my nonfiction writing. Of course, as you know, it was a little late for that. The journal with tumbleweeds in it was already hot off the presses. So I did not give her a copy of that journal for Christmas. I also did not tell her about it. She's my older sister. She's the boss of me. I was terrified. She was already really mad at me. 
Mm -hmm. Then the story got reprinted in another literary journal, which I allowed. Um, I was, this was like kind of the launch of my literary career. And I thought that maybe I, my sister wouldn't find out about it, which I think you're getting the theme here that never think they won't find out about it. She <laughs> found out about it and she was furious, much more furious this time because she had told me don't do this. So she didn't speak to me. We were, she kind of cut me off for almost a year, maybe a little more. Um, and when we finally got back together to talk about it and just really listen to each other, came to a truce, um, I was able to express to her what this writing really was to me and how it was different from all the writing I'd ever done before. Um, she kind of, she's an academic and she had kind of chalked it up to like, and, and this isn't by no way meant to disparage blogging, but in her view, it was sort of a disparagement, you know, it was like publishing my journal or something um, versus like a, a an, an art form. And so she didn't really understand that, but she came to understand it as we spoke and what it meant to me. Um, but, you know, in the end, she still felt strongly she wanted to be left out of it. We have overlapping circles. We both work at the University of Minnesota. She's pretty prominent in her field. Her son went to the same elementary and middle school that my kids went to where I taught for 10 years. And I felt like those were valid concerns. And I also felt that this points to this question we wrestle with of whose story is it? And it, it is my story, but it's also my sister's story. She lived it and more importantly, she suffered it. And so she, I felt had a right to decide, you know, if and how she was included in it or not. Um, so, you know, deciding to leave her out was a was hard because it, it changed the story, it reduced it, it was lesser for not having her there. She was an elemental part of my childhood, but I made the promise and I kept it. And we've been able to keep the peace since then. And I just have um, one last thing to say on this topic, which is something, Laura, that you've talked about before, which is that how our family members react to our work often turns out to be an illumination of what those relationships already contain, including any fractures or frailties. And that was true with my sister. It, it really became clear to us that over time we had chosen different ways of being in the world around these childhood issues and I was much more vocal about them than she was. And it was something that we didn't talk about but but it was causing some tensions between us. And so when I started publishing those stories, those tensions came gushing to the surface and we had to examine them in order to come back to each other and heal that sisterhood, which is what we ultimately did and I feel like are continuing to do. So Laura, I know that you made choices. You know, I le left my sister out of my book and I know you made artistic choices that um, shaped your book in regard to how you included family members. I would really love to hear about those. Yeah, so just to stress, I'm, here I'm talking about, uh, you know, my my spouse and my three kids and my brother, you know, who have done nothing wrong to me. You know, I mean, there's not, it's not like they were not my abuser or something like that. Um, they all had sensitivities about this. And my solution was, in my memoir, the, the full-bodied, complete, developed characters are me and my mother. We are the main characters. We have this, you know, kind of dynamic of war and peace and struggle. And I'm three-dimensional on the page, and so is she. And I think that carries uh, the memoir. But when I went to write about my spouse, um, I, I really limited my portrayal of her. I didn't show her underbelly at all. I didn't write about our marriage in any significant way. I really, she had to be in the book because it's a family story and she was here living through everything I talked about, but she really comes off kind of as just a super supportive spouse, which she is, but I just really minimized what I said about her. So she's just, she's a little flat. She's not as three-dimensional. And with the um, younger kids, they were kids in the time of the book, so it doesn't reflect their adulthood. Um, and, and they're a little bit narrowly focused as well. Um, I knew uh, from a like a artistic point of view, uh, in terms of making the memoir work, that I had to demonstrate that the 
the healing I did with my mother taking care of her at the end of her life, which is for me was really a journey from my head and my judgments and my habitual stories into becoming more open hearted. That for the memoir to work, I had to demonstrate that that learning wasn't just with her, but I could carry it forward into my life after she died. And it probably would have made a lot of sense to demonstrate that with Karen, um, to show how in my marriage, I was able to be more intimate than I had been before. But I knew I couldn't write about that. So I was really kind of stuck. Um, and I decided to use my brother as my foil. I talked to him about it. He was game for me to do it. And so right now, the final scene in the book is not between me and Karen, it's me and my brother. And that was a very conscious choice um, was to, because he was more willing for me to write about him and um, make him not look very good. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, I didn't, even though I got everyone's buy-in in my immediate family to for me to do this and for me to write about them, I did not share with them prematurely, not till the end. Uh, one time when I uh, broke this rule, I regretted it because I went to Karen after a day of writing when I was really proud of a scene I'd written. I really wanted to read it to someone. And I just walked in the kitchen. I said, hey, could I just redo this one scene? And Karen does not read my books. She read this one, but she that's a whole other story why she doesn't read my books. I'm OK with it. But I asked her for this one time for me to read this scene. I read her the scene and she looked at me and she just blurted out, Laura, are you sure you're not just trying to get revenge? Um, and I did not write for the next six months. I almost completely abandoned the book. It, it tapped into my worst fears of who I did not want to be as a writer. Um, and I learned that she is not the person for me to show my work in progress to. Um, at the end, when I was ready to show it to them, which was close to the final draft, I gave it to all my immediate family members. I gave them a month. Um, again, I said, let me know if there's anything you really need me to change. Um, and if it, they did come up with some things, some of it was accuracy, particularly the kids. They had much better brains and memories than I did. I was incredibly grateful for their corrections and the ways they straightened me out on timelines and things. Um, if it was a significant scene and they saw it one way and I saw it another way, I went with my version because it's my memoir, but they corrected many little tiny mistakes I would have made um, just because they remembered more. Um, their feedback was excellent. Um, they were great cheerleaders for me um, and they got way more involved and were way more supportive than I thought. Um, my son Eli even <laughs> created a spreadsheet for me that had all the characters' names um, how old they were in different years, what grade they were in if they were kids, and, and all these logistics of the story, which I found impossible to manage. He created this spreadsheet that helped me keep everything straight. Um, and my brother, his only feedback, uh, and, and those of you who've read the book know that I don't really portray him very favorably. Uh, when he read it, he just said, Laura, could you just say a few more good things about me? Um, and I that was easy to do, and I did. Um, so um, Janine, I'm wondering if there are any other um, artistic compromises you made um, in relationship to um, your concern about how people might react. Yes, uh, there were, but I just have to say, I love that Eli made a spreadsheet. <laughs> so great. Um, my daughters were my primary readers for my manuscript too. So um, they're both excellent readers. They're both writers and um, yeah, really great to be able to have that. But in terms of compromises, you know, I, my, my current husband, we've been together 21 years and he is barely in the, in the manuscript. He's like mentioned once. And I really um, wanted to have him there more. He's um, central to my life, like Karen is to yours. Um, he's also kind of important to the narrative arc because the way that my current marriage is so different from my first marriage mm -hmm. um, is part of the whole dramatic question of my book. But I didn't, um, you know, we came together under difficult circumstances. We were both married at the time. It was, I guess you could call it like an emotional affair. I mention it, describe it briefly in the first chapter of the book. And, um, but I didn't wanna go there in, in the manuscript. We have six kids between us, four grandchildren. Everyone gets along more or less. We have a, you know, a peaceful, um, 
close family and and have moved through all of those challenges. And I didn't feel um, I didn't feel like now is the time to to rip off those band aids, if ever. So that really informed where the book had to begin and had to end. The time span of the book um, really covers about the decade of the narrator's first marriage from the age of 20 to about 30. And um, yeah, so framing the book that way, I just would note that artistically, that the constraint of not choosing to put my current husband in the book ultimately felt like it served the the narrative arc of the book because the story really was about what the narrator experienced in that first marriage that brought her to the point of being able to leave it and expect more for herself and ask more for herself. That really was the end point. And I think that's just for writers something to consider because, you know, there was a part of me um, that wanted to say, but look, it's really good now, you know, and and look, look what this, you know, relationship is like. But sometimes the parts that we want to tell don't really belong to the story we're telling. So um, one other compromise, or at least a strategic decision that I made was in how I portrayed my mom and also my first husband. And with regard to my mom, I chose um, to use a speculative voice to fill out her own traumatic backstory to help readers sympathize and understand some of the otherwise, you know, disturbing choices that she made as a mother. I also left out huge swaths of upsetting material. And that wasn't just to keep the character of my mother more sympathetic and more well-rounded, but also because it just wasn't relevant to the main story. Um, and in addition, it just would have been too much to bear. It was too much for one book to hold, too much darkness for one to hold between that set of pages. And then, but as far as my ex-husband, my aim really was to humanize him and make him three-dimensional, show how the narrator really did love him because she did. It was all of that, but it was also because he is my children's father. And they're now 31, 29, and 26, and they understand their father as the complicated human that he is, as we all are. But um, they also love him very much, and he's literally a part of who they are. So it felt urgent to me to proceed with a lot of caution there, knowing that this book is going to exist for the rest of our lives. Someday my kids might have kids of their own. Those would be my grandchildren and my ex-husband's grandchildren. And someday they might read this book. So I wanted to be not just fair, I wanted to be more than fair. So when my children saw that effort in the pages and they did see it, that felt really right. They recognized their dad and they also recognized the attention that I gave to his best qualities. Um, and I feel like for them that outweighed the necessary attention that I had to give to some of the hurtful things that contributed to the narrator's evolution as a human. And then as a footnote, I used that same approach with all of the members of his family. Um, they were important people in our lives at that time. So I treated them with that same approach, more than fair. And I think those decisions made the book better because the characters feel more complex and more real, but also because the narrator hopefully avoids the trap of heroicizing herself. And, you know, I can't know for sure, but I think maybe it's also a reason why my ex-husband did not decide um, to sue me or even have a hostile reaction to the book because he hasn't. So, um, Laura, what about you? Can you tell us about your extended family members, um, the ones who were most likely to have hostile right. or negative reactions? Yeah, I'll just say a, a few things because we're, we're coming to the time when we want to start taking questions. but. Um, a couple of my cousins that I was concerned about were in one of the scenes uh, in the book. Those of you who've read it, there's a, a time I take my mother to Florida to visit her elderly sister at the end of their lives. Um, and they happened to be there. I just cut them out of the story. They were unnecessary. I mean, that would have been a good literary choice anyway, is cutting out unnecessary characters. Um, and, and what I found was that as I was getting, had decided to publish the book, I had this incredible desire to confess. You know, I wanted to go to all my relatives and say, oh my God, this is what I'm doing. You're going to be so upset. You know, I just wanted to confess. And I went for a walk with Ellen Bass, 
my Courage to Heal co-author, we live in the same town. And she just said to me, Laura, do not tell them until you have a book contract. You don't even know if this book will be published. So I, I always take Ellen's advice. I took her advice. Um, and then, as I said before, I informed them and didn't ask permission. And I'll, I'll make that letter available to you. But I just want to tell you about some of the responses. Um, one cousin, the one whose parents I portrayed in the book, they had died. Um, I didn't ask permission. I said, I've written about your parents. And I want you to know I've written about our grandfather again. And she just said to me, uh, Laura, don't ever talk to me about this again. I said, OK. And then she said, I said, do you want me to use their real names or should I use a pseudonym? And she chose a pseudonym. And I said, do you want to pick their names? And she chose the names for her parents. I mean, it was a very small thing that meant nothing to me. And it gave her a tiny little bit of control over a situation she had no control over. Um, one of my cousins responded was just as ugly and nasty as she had been 30 years earlier. Um, another cousin wrote to me and just blew me away. I cried when I got his email. He said, I've learned something in my 79 years. People are not just one thing. You have a right to tell your story. And I've pre-ordered your book from Bookshop Santa Cruz. I mean, this was such a dramatic turnaround. Um, another cousin wrote me and said that he and his wife and their teenage daughter were reading The Burning Light of Two Stars in their family book club <laughs> and discussing it on all these different levels. Um, and just a few days ago, another cousin called to tell me that she was reading my book um, and taking notes because she was remembering all the things about her own experience being a caregiver um, to her mother. Um, so, you know, these were pretty amazing things. Um, Janine, any last bits you want to cover that you haven't had a chance to mention before we move to questions? Teeny tiny ones. Um, one quick one that applies to both eth ethics and craft. I want to talk about dialogue. When you're writing about other people, you have the opportunity to let them speak for themselves. And that's more than just a craft choice. And I just wanted to note that, you know, both my mom and ex-husband who were big characters in the book are, are big characters in life as well. And I took great care when they opened their mouths on the page to get it right. I really worked hard at it. And when my kids read my book and exclaimed about those characters, when they recognized them as the real people they have known their entire mm -hmm. lives, that was one of the highest endorsements and the most meaningful validations that I could have received. It meant a lot. So I recommend giving real attention and effort to the voices of your family in your yeah. book. It's worth it. Another thing, um, that came as a big surprise for me with my kids is that because I've been writing and publishing for so long, they have been grew up with a mom as a writer, I didn't really understand what a big deal the book would be to them. It was a huge deal for me because it was my literary debut, but I thought for them it would just be another thing their mom had written. But it has been, um, yeah, it's been really overwhelming, the, the, the pride that they've felt in it. I think my son has ordered uh, like you know, a dozen copies from Amazon by now, including one as recently as last month. I think every time he puts in an order, he considers maybe I'll throw in another copy of mom's book. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is one thing that can fly in the face of the advice that we hear over and over again about rounding our characters and making sure to show, you know, the their good qualities, which I talked about with my ex-husband and my mom. I didn't do that with my stepfather who abused mm -hmm. me. I brought him onto the page solely to show um, who, who he actually was in my life as all that he actually was. And, you know, there were some craft decisions I had to make to make that work. Um, but I just wanted to note it because sometimes we need to hear um, with these pieces of advice that seem like they have to be universally, universally right. applied that, you know, it's kind of like this topic, there's an exception to everything. So, yeah. So with that, um, Laura, should we talk about questions? Yeah, I just before that, I just want to let people know that um, we will be sending a follow up email, uh, it will go out tomorrow morning, and it will include a summary of the main takeaways from the event. 
um, links to purchase our memoirs. Um, and also um, I'll send a link out to my website where you could read the letter that I talked about. Um, and Janine, uh, so anyway, you'll just be on the lookout for that tomorrow. And then the um, videotape uh, might take a few days to come, it'll come separately. So just wanna give you that heads up. But yes, let's definitely um, take some questions. Right. Hopefully you have some for us. <laughs> yeah, I have not been able to track the chat. So Zach is going to. Um, yeah, we have a few been... questions that have come in so far. And if anyone else has additional questions, please type them in the chat and I'll get to as many as possible in our remaining time. Um, one question I thought would might be a, a good one to start with. I think it's a good broad question on the subject is it's one part of the journey to write. It's another decision to publish? What was the crux of both of your decisions to publish the work that you wrote instead of keeping this as a personal exercise? You know, this is my seventh book, so I'm an author. <laughs> and, I, you know, it, 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 this is what I do. And I, I believe that this book had a message that uh, could reach far beyond my personal story. And I felt right now, especially with so much estrangement and bitterness in families, uh, that it was a good thing to put out in the world. I think I would say similarly, I've been writing, you know, my whole adult life, and this is the story that I that I had to write. This story is the one that had haunted me my whole adult life, um, my, my whole life, actually. So I, I didn't ever really consider it as something that I wouldn't publish. What was important to me is that I could write something that I would be proud to publish that I would be able to write something that would be crafted and hopefully, though the story is dark, that would be beautiful and that would be receivable by other people in a way that it could offer solace and not just burden. So, and it took me a long time to be able to do that. And I wouldn't have published until I felt like, you know, I had the, the skill to do that. Great. Um, so sort of a question here, uh, I, and I think it's maybe, the question comes down to nonfiction or nonfiction versus maybe auto fiction. So is it better to change the names of family members in one's work rather than use their real names? How about changing place names and time frames as well, but still use the gist of the story so it's more work of fiction than nonfiction? And is, I mean, yeah. yeah. This topic just came up in an online writing group that I'm a part of, and it seems to me that people who publish with big five publishers almost uniformly change virtually all of the names in their books is what I was taking from that conversation. I changed most of the names in my book. I'm with an indie press and there wasn't legal vetting, so it was kind of all on me to decide what I felt comfortable with. Um, but I think, you know, depending on on where you publish, a lot of that is not going to be fully in your um, control to decide. But I don't think I would just add that changing names makes it auto fiction, mm -hmm. changing names, obscuring place, you know, protecting people's identities, and even things like what I did to remove characters or combine characters doesn't make it fiction. It's, um, you know, so that's a, a different thing. It Laura. also does not protect you from being sued. I just no, want to say. it doesn't. Yeah. You know, if someone recognizes themselves or can be recognized by other people, you, you, you know, people, I, I have been sued three times. So Ooh. for what I've <laughs> okay. written, so I have some experience with this and it's, you know, you, you want to avoid getting sued. Let's put it that way. Yeah, an invasion of privacy is a different issue than like, you know, defamation or, you know, so um, yeah, people, if they're not public figures, you, we, we do have to be careful. Again, though, we're not literary attorneys, right, Laura? Right. You, you should definitely get your book vetted um, mm -hmm. before you publish it. So there's a couple related questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask them together. Uh, so first of all, if you're estranged and are writing about the estrangement and how it has affected you, do you show the story to the estranged, in this case, child before publishing? And another person asked, do you need to tell relatives that you're estranged from, that you're writing about them, even if reconnection means reopening wounds and risking your emotional health? I want to address the first one. Um, you know, I think if you have any aspiration to have a relationship with that child in the future, um, I think you know you need you need to really take that into consideration. Writing about them without telling them could absolutely be the last straw, meaning you never talk to that child again. I feel pretty strongly about that. Like it, it, you know, it's again, what what are the stakes 
And what's the worst thing that could happen? If the worst thing is that if this child caught wind of being written about as a character um, and didn't want to be, um, that would be a really good reason to never speak to you again. So I would take be very, very cautious about that. I think that speaks to in the second part, that was a two part question. And mm -hmm. that really nicely reflects what Laura and I have been talking about in terms of um, how each relationship and what's at stake is what must inform the writer's decision about how to proceed in terms of, you know, talking to that person, showing them the work, including them or not, honoring their requests. And so, you know, with me, again, with my sister, um, the risk benefit analysis mm -hmm. was much different than it was with my mom. So this next question in the chat is interesting because I think we've t you've talked a little bit about uh, taking creative license in order to maybe protect other people or to to remove people who didn't want to be included in this in in a piece this question is about the other way which is protecting yourself a little bit so is it wrong to take creative license in some parts of the story intentionally making it counterfactual for the mental health agency of the main character in this case it would be you as the author you know there's things i chose not to write about um you know certain things that i didn't want to expose and other things I felt comfortable exposing. Um, I, I wouldn't invent things that didn't happen, but I think it's more about omission and also what's in the foreground of your story and what's in the background. There's, there's many different ways to construct the same story um, and whether or not you include, there probably are some key scenes that have to be in there, but there are many other choices where you could just decide, you know, I don't want to write about this, so I'm going to find a way to tell this story without this particular moment or this particular scene. I agree with everything Laura just said and would just, um, you know, I, I don't know if this is really exactly related to this question, but just the caveat that we don't want to um, shine a rose colored light on ourselves in our mm -hmm. work. So, you know, if the omission is because it doesn't belong to the story or because um, of, uh, we're not ready to go there yet, that that might be just fine. But if the omission is so that we read a little better than the other characters in the story, then there's a mm -hmm. caution sign there, a big caution sign. Well, I'll just share one little vignette. When I um, gave an early draft of my memoir to a friend who's been a creative writing teacher for 30 years, um, she read it and she just said, you know, you're making your mother the villain and you the hero. And she said, this is incredibly boring. She, she's someone who doesn't pull any punches. And she just looked at me. She said, Laura, this is not the courage to heal. This is the courage to reveal. She said, you have to show your underbelly. And so I, you know, I was devastated. I put the book aside for several months after that. I thought I'm not going to work on it. I can't do this. And then I came back to it and I put her words up on my wall. It's mm -hmm. the courage to reveal. And, and, you know, if you read the memoir now, you'll see that I do not paint a very flattering picture of myself in many instances. And, but the thing is the, the me in the book is a literary construction. You know, people say to me, oh my God, you're so vulnerable. How could you be so vulnerable? Well, these are things that happened a long time ago that I've processed. And also I've created a character of myself. It's not, you're not, you might think you know me from reading this book, but you only know a representation of me that I have crafted for the page. That's why I call the protagonist in my book, the narrator, you know, because it's a constructed version of myself, but with an attempt to show all the warts, like you said, it's really important to, to be as a scrutinizing of yourself as and more so than than anyone else yeah so we had a, a kind of specific question which may not relate to your direct experience but i think your opinions would be valuable which is this may be a different ethical issue altogether but what if your family member has severe mental illness and can't fully sign off on things <sighs> <laughs> It's a really, that's a really challenging dilemma. Um, you know, I, it's interesting because with my mother, I, she wasn't mentally ill, but she had dementia at the end of her life. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew I was writing this book about her during the final years I was caring for her. I was actively writing it and recording things that were happening as they were happening. And I, I did have one conversation with her uh, where I brought it up on one of her more lucid days. And her response was, um, go ahead, dear, it had a happy ending. 
But I actually didn't feel like that really was fully consent because I was talking to someone with dementia, you know, but I went ahead anyway. Um, in part, I talked to my brother about it a lot. My mother was an incredibly public person. She was an actor. She loved being in the limelight. And he just said, she will love being immortalized, Laura, go ahead. And what's ironic is that after you know, at the cousin I was saying had the book club with this book, we had a Zoom, he lives in England. We had a Zoom call about the book after that. And he told me that he had come to visit her um, right toward the end of her life. They'd gone for a walk. And what she said to him was, Lori's writing a book about me. It's okay with me as long as she publishes it after I'm dead. Wow. But I, I never had that conversation with her, but I was very grateful to get that information. It kind of put to rest any residual feelings I had that I had, um, you know, violated her. Um, and, I, you know, I, it was also really important to me at the beginning, people would read, early readers would read the book and they'd say, God, your mother was awful, or how could you stand it? You know, and I was the hero. And I didn't want that to be the case. Um, by the time I got to the end, I knew the book was finished when people would read it. And they'd say, on this page, I hated you and loved your mother. And on this page, I loved you and hated your mother. And so then I knew I had really accomplished um, a fair portrayal. And my relatives all say, oh, yeah, I recognize her. <laughs> and that's really a good thing to get that kind of feedback. Great. Uh, another question from the chat. What do you think about writing under an alias uh, uh, to protect the names of others as well? I could speak briefly to that because I, uh, for a period, was um, working on this manuscript as autofiction. So, you know, while I wasn't necessarily going to publish it under an alias, I was going to distance myself from the material so that the experiences couldn't necessarily be tracked directly to me as mine or my family's. And, you know, that is a that's a viable path that you that you may want to take. But I think two things that I would consider one is that there's absolutely no guarantee that it won't still be tracked to you. You know, an alias mm -hmm. in our time does not necessarily it doesn't necessarily protect anyone. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't count on it. And then the other thing that I would say about it is that a lesson I learned when I was um, pitching the fictionalized version of my memoir, um, one of the responses I got from a very enthusiastic agent was um, that she, you know, she had asked for the full, she was, she was very invested in the writing, and then ultimately she declined. And what she told me was that she um, found it very difficult. Remember, I was selling it as a novel. She found it very difficult to read about a child who was sexually abused at such a young age and so early in the manuscript. And I thought to myself, huh, yeah, it was actually really hard to live that too. And at that point, I knew that I would be writing it as a memoir and publishing it as a memoir. I wasn't making this up or choosing to put this so early in this child's life. And it felt important that it be true and that I stand behind it. But everyone's place with that is, is going to feel different. As with so many of the things that we're talking about in this meeting tonight, so many of these choices are informed by a complex array of multifaceted factors that will differ for each individual. Yeah, uh, this next question is sort of a, a change of pace a little bit, and I think it's an interesting one though, is how do you navigate deciding when you've done enough research on the history of family members, history that isn't necessarily yours? Is there a point where you felt that you've done the family member's history justice? Um, uh, I, I didn't, I mean, the research I did is I had a lot of personal archives. I had um, journals I had kept during the early years where I was going through the most intense conflict with my mother, where we were very estranged. And I had, um, we had kept up a correspondence um, during those years and I had all the letters. And when my mother died, I found a shoebox and it had all the letters she had written to me. It had first drafts of the letters she had not sent to me um, and all my letters. And when I put that together, it was an incredible record of our relationship. And the thing that was, that was very painful and difficult. I had to really force myself to read those letters 
Uh, they were mildewed and moldy. Um, the thing that was the most challenging, which I do write about quite a bit in the memoir, is that those letters contradicted my memories. They disproved my um, my, my storyline. So I had they confronted. It was a confrontation. I had to realize that I had these habitual stories I had set in stone, and the actual physical evidence contradicted them. And I and I decided to uh, write about that contradiction right in the book. Laura, I love that scene in your book. I just want to want to point out that I love that scene where the narrator actually looks at the record of the therapy session and it differs yeah. significantly from how she had remembered it and the story she had told herself. I also had letters and um, you know papers and things from from my adolescence that were really important and. It, I had again, like kind of like our stories are inverse, like I had an opposite experience, like the stuff that was written down and the, like the letters that my mom had sent to some other people were so much worse <laughs> than, you know, the story that I had told myself about it all. Um, I had done some whitewashing, but I just want to say um, quick to the chat, I see this question of autofiction popping up and, um, you know, autofiction is a term, it's kind of contemporary coming out and it just means that it is, it's like you're telling mostly your personal story, but you're, it's mostly true, but there's some things that you're changing and then you're, you're calling it fiction. So um, there's a book called We the Animals by Justin Torres that's a really beautiful short book published as a novel, but it's very much based on his life, um, but but not all of it. There's another beautiful book called Mother of Sorrows by Richard McCann that is, again, he'll say, well, um, he, he actually died a couple of years ago, unfortunately, brilliant writer. And he said, you know, it's like 98% true, but I'm not gonna tell you which 2% isn't. So that's what autofiction is. Why don't we, should we just take one more question and then wrap up? And I mean, I think there were several questions, and I don't think it's something we can address. Maybe we can address addressing it if it's the case, because we have lots of people asking about legal questions and about how right, to deal can't. with those and mm -hmm. finding a lawyer uh, to, uh, or or or, or uh, writer's insurance and things like that. Um, just, I guess, maybe this is my question coming from the many that were coming in. Uh, what what steps or what advice would you give to someone who is concerned about Legal, legal repercussions of the writing, uh, since those questions are still coming in, and obviously important to some people working on, on, on some memoir projects. I guess one thing I want to say, having gone through three lawsuits, um, <laughs> is that you want to avoid getting sued, and that people don't have to have, they don't have to be right to sue you. Um, so it's it's more a question of, are you writing about someone who has proven in the past to be litigious? Like I was fortunate, no one in my family was ever gonna sue me. I knew that, it's just like not something we do. But there are some families or ex-husbands or whatever, you know, who have already shown that they are really willing to sue you. And I think that's a huge consideration. I, I would not blithely go into a situation where you think there's a good chance you'll get sued. It, it can really eat up huge amounts of money and years of your life and be incredibly stressful. Um, so that's what I want to say about that. And I would just add, I have never been sued, but I do carry writer's insurance. And um, I actually got it because when I was doing a lot of content writing, I mean, I have written everything you can imagine under the sun. And um, it, it was just a weird situation that came up. It didn't end up getting legal, but I was worried that it might. And it was so silly because it was over something I didn't care about at all. Um, but I, I carried small business insurance anyway because I teach writing retreats, as does Laura. And um, anyway, it's just something I've always done. And then I made sure that I had a rider on that insurance policy that covered um, libel and other things that come up for writers. Um, but you can go to the Authors Guild. I think all writers who are writing and publishing, especially books, should consider joining the Authors Guild. It's not very expensive and they offer incredible services to writers. So, you know, you can you can Google that, but the Authors Guild is a really helpful resource. Someone just put the Authors Guild member services media liability insurance link in there for us. So Wonderful. thank you. I didn't see your name, but thank you, whoever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, so um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's been wonderful to do this and, and I, people are appreciating being so honest. And I feel like it's the only way for us to share information is like, what are the actual experiences like? 
Um, this is not a theoretical issue. It becomes very real when it's about you and the people in your life. And, and I, you know, I want to go back to what Ginny said at the beginning is that these decisions are not just how you feel in the moment, but as I think we've demonstrated, these decisions have long-term implications. And it's, it's easy to look at the like gold star, the gold ring of getting published. And it's also good to slow down and really think about, about it. And a lot of the changes I've made in my work uh, to, to help people uh, who were struggling with it were super easy to make. They didn't, they didn't impair the work at all. And on a light note to end on, <laughs> to drive Laura's point home, when I was a young writer for that parenting magazine, I wrote with confidence that I would only be having two children. And that's kind of a family joke to this day, says my third child. So the things that we write and publish stay with us, you know, for all the years to come. Um, someone asked about the links that are in the chat. Just be on the lookout for the email that will go out tomorrow morning. It will have all the same links and more, um, including the link to the letter I told you about and, and how to reach us individually. Um, so just be on the lookout for that and you'll get all the information about contacting us and follow up and some uh, bullet points of what we thought the most important takeaways were. And thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming in for your thoughtful uh, comments and questions in the chat. It's been delightful to spend this time with you. And Zach, thank you so much for sponsoring this event um, and being so responsive all the way thank along. Thank you both for bringing this event. This has been fantastic. Thanks to everyone who came out. And again, I just want to reiterate that I hope this, if this is your first time, it's not your last time joining the Writer Center. And this is your first time uh, interacting with Laura and Janine. Hopefully it is definitely not your last time of interacting with them, reading their work, attending their workshops and seeing them in the future. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening.